You know, it's wonderful to be here today celebrating uh, inspiring women in science. I'm excited to tell people today about African people and wildlife and our work to find the balance for communities and nature. And I thought to kick it off, I'd like to take you over to Africa, to Tanzania, to meet some of the team members uh, that are doing the incredible work on the ground here in Tanzania um, with communities, wildlife, and nature. So Joe, if you'd play that first video, please. Thank you. Africa represents our planet in some of the most phenomenal ways, with its incredible diversity of people, wildlife, and landscapes. I sense here that I'm part of something bigger than myself. In Tanzania, I'm constantly inspired and humbled by the connections between all things wild and human, but I'm also acutely aware of the delicate bonds between them. If we break them, we lose something that can never be replaced. We have a responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen. Kabla ya African People and Wildlife kulikuwa na migogoro baina ya watu na wanyama wakali hasa simba. Watu waliwaua simba kwa wingi na kuwatoesha moja kwa moja. At African People and Wildlife we are finding the balance for communities in nature. We are working to ensure that vital ecosystems and species endure for generations to come. A key part of that is the participation of local people our key partners on the ground. African People and Wildlife is a unique organization because we transcend the boundaries of conservation and community development. Where we work, the majority of the land is shared between people and wildlife. So we partner with local communities to ensure that every single one of our projects equally benefits people and wildlife, creating those powerful win-win scenarios. Elimu mbutahai kusaidi matukio mwaletea wanyama kama simba, duma, mbamwitu, kongeseka katika jijijetu na hata tarangiri. In northern Tanzania, we've reduced livestock attacks by up to 90% at the Boma or cattle corral and lions are now coming back. Our team members are global leaders in community-driven conservation. Because we base 100% of our operations in the field, we become part of the community, a real resource and partner. Because we live among the people and emphasize hiring locally, our team members have a specialized knowledge of community wildlife dynamics. This is a key part of our success. African people and wildlife, together with local communities, we are restoring the vital habitats that are crucial for both people and the wildlife. Through our Sustainable Rangeland Initiative, community members are using innovative technology, data collection, and information sharing to conserve their grazing lands. Asasi ya watu na wanyamapori inaunganisha ulinthabitu wa mazingila na kuboresha maisha ya wanajamii ili kutafuta uiano baina ya uhifazi na maisha badaya ya wali. Sababu tulia, tulipata ilimu ya ujasiri ya mali, tukawanzisha mradi wa mizinga, tukawa tuna, tukapata ilimu ya sisi wenyewe kupandisha ya mizinga na kupakua sisi wenyewe na now people have more options for their livelihoods. Kwa ujumla tunaamini tukiwekeza katika elimu, kujenga uwezo na uhifadhi ni nguzo muhimu kwa vijana wa sasa na wa kesho. It's very crucial to ensuring the future of people and wildlife in this landscape. We need you to get involved in this program so that we can expand into other areas of northern Tanzania. This is a model with global significance. African people and wildlife's vision is to quadruple our reach over the next decade, positively impacting tens of thousands more wildlife and the people they live among. To do this, we'll share our unique model of community-driven conservation with more and more partners across Africa, 
while continuing to expand our effective on-the-ground conservation efforts in Tanzania. If we can make sure that local communities are well positioned to protect Africa's wildest landscapes for both people and wildlife, then we will have done our job well. It's a legacy we all can be proud of. I hope you enjoyed that uh, video of our team members and the community members that we work with to find the balance for communities and nature. A lot of people often wonder how I got involved in this work, and it's been a lifelong legacy of love for lions. But that really, as I got to know people on the African continent more, it, it broadened out into a passion for the people, the culture, the wildlife, the landscapes of this uh, incredible continent. And so I've been blessed um, to be able to pursue my passion, which really started as a young girl with a dream. Um, and I've just worked and worked towards that dream of getting to actually see a real wild lion, uh, which I did when I was um, just a freshman in college and was able to go to Kenya and spend some time there with the National Outdoor Leadership School and to learn about the country and the people and the wildlife. And then I returned later on uh, to do research in southern Kenya as a Fulbright scholar and really began to look at local people's relationship to the natural world and to conservation. And I found this intriguing. I pursued my PhD in social ecology and wildlife ecology at Yale University. And uh, I met my husband in Tanzania, where I was then moving on to do my research. And, and when we finished that work, uh, some time ago, we decided to put the research into action and we co-founded African People and Wildlife and began to develop the Noloholo Environmental Center. So you're seeing a picture there of the center, um, which is in northern Tanzania on the southeastern edge of Terengiri National Park. So that small inset at the bottom is the actual that line you see in the middle of the, the photo is the boundary between Terengiri um, on the left hand side of the photo or the western side. and community lands on the eastern side where our Noloholo Environmental Center resides. And one of the first major innovations coming out of Noloholo and our partnership with local communities was the living wall, which you see there, the, the circular enclosure of cattle. Um, it's a fortified livestock corral that uses living growing trees as fence posts, often Camifer Africana that you see growing there. And those fence posts help to hold up some chain link fencing, which keeps uh, lions, leopards, hyenas, and other carnivores out. And it keeps people's livestock safe at night. And of course, in the background there, you see beautiful Mount Kilimanjaro. So this photo was taken in the West Kilimanjaro landscape. And with living walls, we've been able to dramatically decrease conflict between people and lions. And we've been able to keep people's livestock safe in partnership with them. They invest uh, in the living wall and both um, the purchase of the chain link and the installation of uh, the fence. And as a result, lion populations have been able to rebound. And so this little girl, cute little girl is named Indito. Uh, she belongs to a pride uh, that resides around the Noloholo Environmental Center and in the community of Lobaseret. And because we're able to reduce conflict and because there is such incredible tolerance still among local people for living with lions, Indito and her family is going strong. And here she is with her mother. Uh, she's about two years old now um, and continues to roam, spending more than 50% of her time outside of Tarangiri National Park. Uh, in the community land. So again, it's just absolutely critical that we work with our local partners to find conservation solutions. And that's why the innovative living walls were so successful because the original idea came from the community themselves. And really at the heart of our, our work at African People and Wildlife is this idea of holistic conservation, bringing all the pieces together on a landscape. And so we work in a number of different areas, whether that's strengthening natural resource stewardship, whether it's developing conservation enterprise or conserving wildlife, restoring and connecting landscapes or building strategic partnerships. We're always looking for those win-win opportunities where both people and wildlife thrive. Um, and all of these initiatives, we layer our impact um, in the geographies where we work. So where we're able to prevent conflict successfully, we want to layer on top of that really good grassland management. And on top of that, we want to layer strong benefits for local community members to continue to protect uh, these important resources. 
And throughout it all, we're always asking why do local communities want to protect their natural environments? And we want to work with them to develop sustainable long-term solutions that come from them themselves and meet their own goals for environmental conservation. So another great example is our women's beekeeping initiative. We're working with over 100 women's groups in Northern Tanzania um, to help them uh, work in the beekeeping enterprise and to be able to harvest honey. Um, the honey is harvested out in the bush. So anywhere um, the women hang their hives, those trees are protected from cutting and it's not allowed to cultivate within a certain perimeter of the tree. And so it protects wild spaces where wildlife and livestock are also roaming. Of course, we like to um, ensure that the women also have state-of-the-art technology. And so we have working uh, in partnership with Esri, we have dashboards that help the women to track um, their progress. Um, and what you see here is, for instance, a, a dashboard showing how many hives were hung in a particular year, how many total hives overall were harvested in that year, um, and again, uh, an accounting of how many crude um, tons of honey have been harvested. Um, over 16 and a half tons of honey have been harvested um, to date with this project, and we're about to launch a very exciting women's enterprise center that um, has a fully equipped um, state-of-the-art honey processing center um, so that the women can um, really start bringing their honey to market um, in a bigger way. Similarly, we work with community members to protect uh, the rangelands, the, the pastures where both wildlife and livestock depend on for both um, critical grazing resources and of course the predators follow the wild prey into these pastures, um, so it's important habitat for both. Again, we develop this system in partnership with local community members, understanding what's important to them in terms of measuring and monitoring the quality of their grasslands, which are so critical to pastoralists, people of cattle, people of livestock, whose livelihood is absolutely dependent on healthy grasses, healthy water sources, a healthy natural environment. And again, we do this uh, by developing dashboards in partnership with community members, looking at what information is important to them um, to collect about the quality of the grasslands. And I apologize, this is in Swahili, um, because of course that's more relevant to our partners, but they're looking at things like um, how many invasive species up there in D uh, do we see on the landscape and which ones in particular. In E, what's the length of the grass over time? And you can see it dips down lower in September and October um, as the dry season becomes more heavily upon us. And then the height of the grass starts to be replenished in November and December as the rain comes. And then in F, their own assessment of the quality of the rangelands. And really important in G is just a photo of the area, which then by using dashboards and having um, tablets, community members can share with uh, decision makers in their environments, which pasture should be grazed, which should be closed off, which should be weighed, weighted to be used uh, for drought scenarios. This is a really, really powerful system that we're also working now to share at higher levels at the district, regional and governmental levels so that everyone has access to this data. And really, when we look going forward, so what, what does this all mean for African people and wildlife? We're in an incredibly exciting period of transition where we're working to establish now Nolaholo as a center of excellence for holistic conservation so that the innovations, ideas, partnerships coming out of Nolaholo um, can really begin to influence conservation policy on a national level in a systemic way and also even internationally. And so some of the work, uh, innovative work that our team has done in Tanzania is now translating into strong conservation work uh, in Angola, in the southeastern uh, highlands, uh, a critical Lisima water tower, which provides critical water resources to the very world famous Okavango Delta downstream and the people, the wildlife and the environments that depend on that. Um, this is an exciting partnership with the National Geographic Okavango Wilderness Project that we're really excited to be lending our community engagement expertise uh, to this very important project in this very, very important landscape. Other things uh, that are happening right now um, at African People and Wildlife, we just recently launched an African Women in Conservation initiative so that we can really help uh, Tanzanian women to climb the ladder, the conservation ladder here in Tanzania. Uh, with this effort, we'll be working with the Tanzanian government to understand what some of the barriers and opportunities 
um, to engaging in and and getting a leadership position eventually in Tanzania are. We'll be offering internships, conservation internships for women every year so that they can get their foothold in the conservation sector and then help them to work with partners to continue to pursue their career. Um, and one incredible leader, this is Yamat Langai, who's a local Maasai woman in our monitoring and evaluation team. She's also the heroine of a recent film um, called Terengiri, Our Heritage, Our Future. So I, um, I encourage you to look at that film and get a, get a real glimpse of the Terengiri National Park and the work that Yamat and others are doing to protect this incredible landscape. But we want to help support more women like Yamat who are incredible leaders in their communities um, to engage more in conservation over the long term. We're also just now launching a very exciting project uh, to help protect the big jumbos, the elephants of the Ngorongoro Conservation Area Authority. Um, this project is a partnership with the Elephant Crisis Fund and Global Con Conservation, along with the Ngorongoro Conservation Area Authority, to help bring the authority together with local community members to improve their human wildlife conflict management and mitigation so we can get more information quickly so that when uh, elephants are in the crops or other species are causing issues, there's a communication between the community and the, the authority and we can resolve these conflicts in a way that works for everybody in the landscape. So a very, very important partnership um, emerging in that landscape. And of course, uh, we continue to uh, build our youth conservation programming. The youth are the future of conservation. We wanna get them interested and excited early on. Um, again, working with many local community members, they already have a very strong connection to the environment. We wanna simply um, continue to build on that relationship and excitement. And we're very uh, thrilled this year to hopefully be able to resume our trips to Terengiri National Park, where we give uh, children the opportunity to go into the park and witness um, the wildlife um, that's contributing to uh, um, the future of their country, both from an economic and a natural resource point of view, um, get them excited about it. Um, and of course, we were had to put some of these trips on hold due to COVID, but we're really hoping to be able to resume this um, again and, and to begin to inspire again the next generation and to continue to provide scholarships for up and coming youth. Um, we have a number of kids that have now um, graduated from our high school scholarship program and have pursued college and university degrees and other diplomas. So it's really exciting um, that this uh, future network uh, are now uh, actually emerging as some of today's leaders. Um, so there's a lot going on at African People and Wildlife, and I encourage you to um, look us up on social media or keep tabs of our website. There's always something new and exciting happening at African People and Wildlife, and uh, we love for people to get involved and ask questions and um, continue to follow our work. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity um, to speak with you all today. Back to you, Joe. All right, Laylee, thank you so much for uh, an awesome presentation. And, you know, every time we talk, I, I've been lucky enough to host you for a lot of live events with classrooms uh, all over the world. Every time we speak, you've got new projects on the go. It's it's so impressive. So uh, a huge you. congratulations to you and, and the whole team. Thank you very much. Uh, the team is just uh, continuing to grow, um, doing an incredible job. Um, and I, I can't speak enough about the, the, the team members. They're, those are the heroes of conservation. I'm just here to represent them today. All right. Well, I, I've got a few questions for you before we let you go today. And, you know, watching the presentation, I thought uh, of, of a few things. So the first one, I loved seeing all the team members using the technology, whether it's smartphones, GIS, camera traps, uh, and things like that. So I wonder... Initially, when you were bringing in that new technology, was there uh, any resistance to the technology? And then what kind of opportunities has that technology, the knowledge of that technology brought to the community? I think because we had worked with community members for such a long time in different ways to collect data, starting with very traditional paper data collection protocols, then moving slowly onto online systems and then to the much more sophisticated platform. Because we did it gradually, we didn't see resistance. We saw people building skills, people that we had been working with for many years, wanting to continue to build those skills. And so people are really excited um, about using this technology. And 
what it's done for us and, and for our partners um, across Northern Tanzania is just tremendous because it's put information in real time back into the hands of the people that are collecting it, the owners actually of that data. So they're able to use their data in real time. Um, the analyses are updating every time more information comes in. People have access to maps. They can look at, for instance, where is conflict occurring with lions in their community. They can get a sense of where the problems are and how um, to resolve those problems. And then at a bigger level, we're now able to share this data. And there's a tremendous amount of data coming in. So we have um, four team members on our monitoring and evaluation team. It's not even enough at this point to keep up with all the data coming in and ensuring that it's cleaned and properly. If we didn't have this technological solution, um, we would not be able to share this data, you know, in a reasonable time frame. Um, but what we're able to do now is share it with other conservation partners, with government authorities, of course, with the communities that we work with. And so it becomes more meaningful because it becomes accessible to a, a larger um, group of people and can be used in many, many different ways. So it makes it much, much more powerful from my point of view. Okay. And now to kind of look at it from the other perspective, traditional knowledge of the land uh, you know, that the community has is, is invaluable. So I wonder what kind of impact did it have uh, on, on your views and, and the work you were doing initially? How did bringing that traditional knowledge in kind of change maybe your initial thoughts when you started? The traditional knowledge is absolutely the key. Um, when I first started doing research in Northern Tanzania for my PhD, spending time learning from people was absolutely critical learning their perspectives, their ideas, how they talk about conservation, the dialogue. Um, and I think that's what's led to so much of our success at African People and Wildlife is that we turn the question around and really look at it from the community point of view. Um, and so even when you're, you know, to connect this to the dashboards, the data that you see coming in there, when we develop those systems, we develop them in partnership with community members what information do they want to record on the landscape? There's many different things, obviously, from a rangeland point of view, from a scientific technical point of view, you could be collecting. But we wanted to make sure that the primary information that people were spending their time on was relevant to the local people. And so basically what we took is the traditional system of measuring the height of grass, the amount of bare ground that has been done for centuries on the landscape and just put it into a technical solution that just sped up some of the access to the information. But I, I think at the heart of our model at African People and Wildlife is really recognizing how much knowledge there is on the ground uh, with the people and that if you can um, open up that information reservoir, you can get to solutions that are sustainable on over the long term because they come from the local people um, and they make sense to them. Yeah. Well, I can see why you've been so successful with your work. I was watching uh, one of your conservation videos on YouTube this morning and, and you said, you know, effective conservation, you really have to commit to an area. And that's something that you've definitely done. Establish that trust, have a great team, and it looks like the, the next generation is right on board as well uh, and excited to, to play their role. Yeah, the, the commitment to this area we will always have at African People and Wildlife. I think we all um, struggle with how does one go to scale? And so what we found is that by having these deep relationships and you know continuing um, to address conservation challenges in these landscapes, the way we go to scale is by helping others understand the process by which we do our work, by bringing people into the landscape through peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities at Nolaholo, to then take the best practices from this work and implement it in the landscapes where they are. Because we know every one of these landscapes has its unique issues. They're, they have unique ecological setting, unique culture, and unique politics, economics. Um, but there are best practices in how we can engage that that can go to scale across the continent. And that's, um, again, one of um, our sort of big uh, efforts with our capital campaign for Nola Holo at the moment. All right. So I want to ask a little bit about the beekeeping. So uh, obviously a great initiative, great income for the community. Uh, it has that added benefit of, you know, areas where the hives are. It's protecting those areas as well. I know in some parks they use beekeeping as well to kind of 
keep elephants from going in certain areas. Is that being utilized as well in your area? So where we are, we haven't had as many issues in the crop. So in the Terengiri Manyara ecosystem, uh, we haven't implemented that technique yet, but that technique is being used in Ngorongoro. And um, we hope to be working with partners in, as we begin to launch this new project to potentially bring that um, beehive fencing uh, effort to the Ngorongoro conservation area. So I think, again, it, it's a matter of ensuring that the solutions that you're implementing are relevant in the areas, but it, it's an incredible project and absolutely one that we hope to, to look to implementing uh, in Ngorongoro with partners. All right. And maybe just to touch on as we're kind of wrapping up for today, the BOMAs, the Living Walls, uh, are such a great project. I wonder how many do you think have been implemented uh, since the first one? And then are they pretty self-sufficient or do they need to be renewed over time? So today we have over 1,500 active living walls on the landscape. So when you see our numbers, those are the numbers of the ones that are active and working in the landscape. We may have installed a few more, but people move or you know things change. Um, they do not require too much upkeep. Every two to three years, our M&E team will go out and try to visit every single one of the living walls. And if there are some issues that need to be addressed, then we'll recommend uh, the community mem members make a few adjustments. If there are any major issues, for instance, the gates um, perhaps um, have become, you know, worn over time or, or have issues, then we will often help to um, to work on those and to, to replenish them. But I think it's really important that um, we don't just put a living wall out there and then forget about it over time. We are revisiting them um, and ensuring that they're productive and active. And, and I think that's why we've had um, such success in, in recovering um, or initiating the recovery of the Terengiri lion project, is, uh, Terengiri lion population, because there are so many living walls in this landscape now. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it's, uh, the effectiveness is, is obviously really impressive. And, you know, the, I think you probably agree the community has always lived with lions. They don't want them gone, but when those conflicts happen, then, you know, it's tough. So, Having these solutions like the living walls, uh, it really benefits both sides, the lions and the community, and it looks like both are thriving. Absolutely. I mean, one of the first questions we asked uh, in the early years, I'm not going to say how long ago that was, <laughs> um, was do people still want to see lions on the landscape? And they absolutely did. They wanted their children to hear the roar of the lion, but they also don't want um, their prized cattle you know, being taken on a daily basis. I mean, that's basically like to... To a pastoralist, having a lion come and kill your cattle is like having someone break into your home or break into your bank account. Um, it's personal. Um, and so being able to work together to reduce those conflicts, what we've seen is just, and again, I think it's an example for the world, the incredible tolerance that people in these landscapes have for large, dangerous wildlife in their backyard is just tremendous. It's heartwarming and it's an example that the world should really be looking at for conservation and for how we, um, you know, respect the natural world around us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Laylee, it's always a pleasure to connect. I always think back to one event we did where we sent you with a satellite unit. And we connected <laughs> out uh, in the grassland. You had some of your team piled into the back of a, a truck. And I remember just how excited everybody was to be sharing the work that they were doing uh, and how passionate they were. So again, thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, a huge shout out to your team. Uh, it is great work. I want to share the link here as well. One more time, I encourage everybody to go visit, learn more. Of course, support the project in any way that you can. Uh, and uh, Laylee, it's always a pleasure to connect and, and hear about the new projects and, and see there's always more coming down the pipeline. Thanks so much, Joe. And thanks for always training a lens on all these incredible uh, projects around the world with your effort. It's, it's um, tremendous to be able to get this information out to other people and to be able to share and you know, stimulate ideas and science and thought and women's leadership. So um, that's really, really critical. And I appreciate that opportunity. And, and let's get another uh, session going in the field again soon. <laughs> all right, absolutely. All right, for now, we'll say goodbye, but uh, I don't think it'll be too long before we connect again. Thanks so much, uh, Laylee. Thank you.